The Home Tech Podcast is supported by you. To find out more, go to hometech.fm slash support. This is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, March 22nd from Denver, Colorado. I'm Jason Griffin. And from Sarasota, Florida, I'm Seth Johnson. Jason, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to Cody for jumping in last week. Definitely appreciate that. Yeah, uh, Cody, he's a, he's a great guy. I, I can count on, the, count on him in a pinch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. As in as in the same day when I think I'm like, oh yeah, there's a show tonight and Jason Jason's in ba- Boston. Ba- Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had a nice trip out there. It's always good. Uh as listeners probably know, that's where the One Vision headquarters is. And so I periodically go out there and get to spend some time with the team. So I really enjoyed that. And again, thank you, Cody, for jumping in. Uh, but I am happy to be back for our two hundred and fiftieth episode so this is kind of a landmark our our sester centennial uh, <laughs> you said episode, it you said it <laughs> <laughs> as uh, as google would have us uh, put it and uh got a great guest on this show we have martin pleen from uh the ceo of control four lined up so definitely stay tuned for that uh control four has been a really a really busy company lately and so we're gonna we're gonna chat with martin about all of the things that they've been up to uh, here over the last year or so, and there's been no shortage of activity for them. So definitely, uh, you know, look forward to sharing that conversation uh, with our listeners. Yep. And speaking of speaking of doing things, Jason, I've been busy. I've been on a I've been on an acquisition spree of my own. I mean, Control Four is buying up everybody left and right. So look what I've got here. Not this to box. be outdone. Not to be outdone. What Ooh. is this? This is a this is a shiny it's an new antique <laughs> Lowe's Iris. Uh, hub, yeah, gen- generation one hub. So not the second, but the first one. I had to get the first one. Okay. So I got, got one more thing. Oh, I've got one more. Uh, this is our little. We got an un- unboxing on this week's episode. Yeah, here's our our Yibo, Yibo, Jibo, Jibo. <laughs> so Jibo. This is another. Greg in the Jibo. chat room says no one can see what you are doing. Yeah, no, no, it's a radio show. I'm showing it's Jason. He show. can see. We got it. We got it. And they, they sent me since see the it. shirt. The shirt wasn't gonna fit me that they sent me. Um, I got a USB thing that I'm I'm not plugging into a computer because <laughs> too paranoid to plug USB things into my computer. So what you're telling me is you've you've started your IoT museum collection. You uh, are now officially a curator of of IoT uh, relics. Yep, 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 yep. So now now I've got one surprise for you. Now you've seen those two. I got one surprise for you, Jason. Look at this. Oh, you didn't. Oh, it's a Revolve <laughs> Hub. <laughs> that is a yes. good one. Hard to find. Hard to, harder to find than I thought they would be. So yeah, I am. Um, I'll. Uh, I've got to think. I'm going to put some shelves up and, and put these up on the wall or something. But um, yeah, got the IoT Museum starting up here. <laughs> got. I've got a Revolve, a Yibo or Jibo. I guess it's Jibo because it's not Spanish. And a uh, <laughs> Iris and and my Nero remote. My Nero remote will be going up there uh, shortly. Um, so. So starting I've got four the, things. Starting the collection. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm limiting it to things that are, uh, like that that we we started the show. I'm not I'm not going back because you you know that we we you and I could go back and find things. Um, I'm not doing that. I'm I'm gonna limit to what you know what started with the show and kind of things that we've covered and like you know of course we we've definitely covered Revolve. We've we've covered we've covered these other things, uh, and I'm limiting it to the time frame that the show's been on because. All there's, right. There's definitely more out there that's died, and I'm not. Well, I'm not getting every light bulb, every smart light bulb that existed out there for a flash in a pan. I'm not. I'm not yeah. going down that road. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's just stupid. Yeah. Well, that that could be quite the collection. Yep. Uh, Greg is asking about Wink. That's a That's one you may have to. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on with Wink. These it's been days. done more than once, but I mean, uh, what's his name over there uh, with the black eyed peas? Must be doing really well with it. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, I think his company bought oh, it. So. Man. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. You never know. It's All gonna right. Happen. Well, I want to see pictures. Pictures or it didn't happen. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> what do you say we jump into some home tech headlines? All right. Let's do it. Snap AV snapped up. Uh-huh. MRI distribution in the company's third distributor purchase uh, in the in the past year. Uh, MRI was a member of the Powerhouse Alliance and has three branches located all in the Northeast. In a memo to dealers, MRI said it will have Snap AV products available at its branch locations and online. In the coming weeks, and for now, your shopping routine will remain unchanged. Well, Snap AV definitely staying aggressive on this path. That's Volutone out in California and Allnet in the Midwest, and now rounding it out with MRI in the North 
east. So it looks like the looks like the southeast is going to be next, Seth. That's your neck of the woods. So we'll have to southeast. Yeah, we'll have to see who who they've got their eyes on down there. But they are definitely uh, making some big moves. Well, they're already in the southeast. I mean, they, they're out of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I want to say that's true. So, so yeah. they they've already got HQ there. Um, and I think they had something in the northwest. Uh, they had a warehouse out out west somewhere. So they they may be covered as far as having their product available to dealers. I, I think one of the biggest things they're going to be able to do with this is have if you need a Snap AV mount or a Snap AV product, you 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 can almost get it within you know a day or two worth of shipping from any any of these locations, right? Right. At a, at a very low price. So. Um, or you can just walk in and, and pick it up at a branch location. So they're, they're going to have a, a reach that I don't think any other distributor, you know, maybe outside Amazon has <laughs> in, uh, in the States here. Right, right. And they, they definitely are like the Amazon of this uh, little channel of ours. So uh, very interesting. All right. Well, moving on here, IKEA is delaying the release of its smart blinds until later in 2019 while it works on improved firmware, the furniture company confirmed to The Verge. The smart blinds were originally supposed to be released last month in Europe and hit U.S. stores April 1st, but IKEA is delaying the launch because it wanted to ship the product with Alexa, Siri, and Google Assistant integrations built in rather than delaying them for a firmware release later this year. Smart move. Yeah. You know, ship something that's uh, sort of fully baked. It sounds like probably the core functionality was there, but they wanted to well, I, I guess I say that, and I'll, I'll back up a bit. We've talked on the show a lot about these sort of integrations with things like Siri and Google Assistant kind of being table stakes now, right? So it kind of does make sense that if those things weren't quite ready, that that they would hold hold back and and not ship it. Right, right. I'm glad I'm glad they're I'm glad they're holding it off, like you said, fully baked, uh, because it 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 wouldn't make any sense to go down and pick up a smart blind. That you couldn't control. That isn't your, smart. Your, yeah, it isn't smart. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, glad to see they did that. Yeah. Um, speak, speaking of IKEA, uh, you've seen the prototypes, but now IKEA has set the date to show off its first Sonos-powered Symphonisk speakers. <laughs> Thanks for that one, Jason. Like, Tongue-tied. Yep, I put these in a strategic order Sally tonight. Sally sells, she sells, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sally sells Sonos <laughs> Symphonisk. Uh, the products, plural... Yeah, there's more than one, uh, will will be revealed on April 9th in Milan before they're expected to go on sale in August. IKEA and Sonos have showed off a prototype to the world, reads the IKEA press release, a bookshelf speaker that will give customers a great connected speaker that enables multifunctional usage in the home at an affordable price. Uh, the speakers are expected to start at $120. And late breaking news here, just like a couple minutes ago, on Twitter, Dave Zatz, Ran across the uh, the FCC labels, uh, which uh, the link that I had isn't working anymore, so you must have pulled them down. Hmm. But uh, we'll go ahead and dig and, and find those things. I, I, we were we were kind of laughing at them because the 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 input on the on the thing was one one amp. <laughs> so I mean, it's, it's, don't expect these speakers to like compete with a Sonos anything. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know, sound wise. But I think having like an IKEA affordable IKEA package, looking good looking speaker. Plus, the Sonos Brains is really a compelling product. Yeah, yeah. IKEA is doing a lot. So blinds, uh, speaker now, some smart lighting. Um, yeah, it's it's very uh, uh, sort of unexpected entrant, right? That we've seen um, continue to develop here over the last year or so. So we'll continue to to keep an eye on that. Uh, LG today announced a collaboration with the Denver-based home automation company Josh AI that will enable owners of multiple LG TVs to control those displays using voice commands as they walk from room to room. With Josh AI Smart Home Integration, LG's 2018 and 2019 OLED, Super UHD, and UHD televisions can be controlled using simple and natural language commands such as raise the volume and switch inputs to Roku. Or more complicated multi-part directives like watch Stranger Things Season 2 Episode 3, Turn up the volume on the TV, draw the shades to 40%, and dim the lights a little. The system will support voice control for any device in the room uh, the room the user is in. LG said it is committed to developing features that make its TVs easier to integrate with smart home control systems. This is great. I mean, good good for Josh. I mean, this is this is a good uh, this this press release came from LG that I or I think it was a press release that came from LG. Uh, it's not like L- LG doesn't have these APIs out there that exist that, you know, you can't do this with anything. But it sounds to me like this is like 
a little bit more formal uh, operation with Josh to to bring voice control into the LG ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll be curious to see what this looks like completely in practice. But I mean, it it sounds like a great a great integration all around. Like just straight to the TV, tell it what to do. And I, I think it's it's great too when you see these larger companies like LG and Sony comes to mind. I know Sony's done quite a bit in in past years to make their uh, AV receivers come to mind as an example of, uh, you know, making them sort of integrator friendly and having like remote monitoring built right in and things of that nature. So, you know, I always love when I see these bigger companies um, kind of thinking about the the more fully integrated home and, and the channel that that many of us and our listeners operate in. So, yeah, all good news all the way around. Speaking of big companies, uh, Apple, uh, March 25th event right around the corner. So, this will come out on the 22nd, and three more days later, you'll <laughs> everybody will know by the time we record next week uh, what exactly Apple TV projects are. Yep. Uh, the Apple March 25th event sports the tagline, It's Showtime, and the gathering, it's rumored to be the official unveiling of the company's uh, slate of television and movie programming. A recent unconfirmed report suggests that at least five projects have been com- completed filming with a long list of additional TV shows and feature-length movies in various stages of development or production. What isn't known, however, is when and where audiences will be able to see these projects. The answer to that question will likely be a big part of the event on Monday. So, yeah, that'll be fun to watch, I'm sure. Yeah. It's going to be like the end of an era, Seth, because we can no longer speculate about Apple's TV offering. Oh, it, it's Apple. There, there's we'll be able to speculate on something else they come up with. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's true. We still have our what WWDC bets on on HomeKit every year. So <laughs> that's right, the HomeKit over under. Right. <laughs> yeah, this will be good though. I, I'm excited to see what they're doing, and we've read all the all the stories, and we've talked about numerous ones of them on the air, and it sounds like they're trying to do something different. And unique. I know it's been sort of a long and drawn out thing for them. And you've heard all the stories about battles and negotiations with the content providers and, and things of that nature. So it'll be good to see what they're finally able to, uh, you know, lift the curtain on. And, and uh, yeah, we're not we're not far away. So it's exciting. All right. Well, that does it for our headlines. All of the links and topics that we've discussed here in our show can be found on our show notes at hometech.fm slash 250. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for our weekly newsletter where we will send you uh, weekly show reminders as well as other occasional updates about all of the great things going on in the world of home tech. Once again, that link is hometech.fm slash 250. And don't forget you can join us live each Wednesday starting sometime between 7 and 7.30 p.m. uh, Eastern. A little bit late last week, a little bit early this week. Yeah, we do our best. To find out more, go to hometech.fm slash live and, uh, and and follow us on Twitter at Home Tech Podcast, where you get, we usually put out the announcements. We do that there and and in the hub. So uh, if you want to know when we're recording, that's that's when uh, just follow us on Twitter. It's a labor of love, right, Seth? Yep. And- yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our interview. Once again, very, very excited to have Martin Pleen, the CEO of Control 4, join us to talk about all of the great things that they've been up to here over the last year or so. So we hope you enjoy. Hey, Martin, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no, we're, we're excited to have you. I know it's been, a, it's been a really busy time for Control 4. We've definitely been you know, talking about you a lot on the show and watching what's been going on and really excited to have you on to uh, catch our listeners up on all of that. But before we do, you know, I think the, the, the vast majority of our, our audience certainly familiar with you, at least by name, uh, but would love if you could take a couple of minutes just to give a, a personal introduction and maybe talk about uh, some of the relevant points of, of your background that, that have brought you uh, to where you are today as, as the CEO of Control 4. Um, well, Control 4, you know, our purpose and, and mission is to improve uh, consumers' lives in their homes Um, through connected technology and solutions. Uh, We're 100% focused on delivering that in the realm of uh, connected entertainment, connected and intelligent lighting, um, you know, safety and security, peace of mind. And we do that through hardware and software solutions and a broad, broad platform of interoperability and and interactive functionality that we enable other people to plug into. And I think that that opportunity is huge. It continues to expand. The world's not gonna be less connected tomorrow than it is today. 
and a big portion of that connectedness is going to be within homes and houses. And um, that opportunity was presented to me eight and a half years ago um, by the founders of Control 4. And um, through a confluence of experience and connections, um, my path with Control 4 and its investors and its founders um, created an opportunity and a discussion. And in August or September 2011, I jumped in with both feet and brought my software experience, my international business experience, platform, ecosystem, multi-sided business models um, to Control 4. And we have a fantastic team and had a beautiful opportunity that was expanding. And we've been going after it. And today we're, we're probably three times what we were uh, seven years ago. You know, top line, certainly far more profitable, continuing to grow, um, more employees, more countries, larger dealer network. But our fundamental strategy and our fundamental focus yeah. hasn't changed. That. Yeah, we're and we're we're definitely going to jump in and talk about that because I've I've had uh, you know the opportunity to, to to get to know you and 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 have several conversations with you about that and I think you have a really great perspective and a really valuable one when it comes to uh, the the professional channel and the value of that channel, especially in today's uh, sort of dynamic marketplace where you're hearing more and more about uh, about these other entrants and what's going on and how does that you know how is that going to affect the channel and. Uh, so definitely look forward to that. But yeah, you so you've taken control for through the IPO, which I think was back in 2013. And, and I know the company's seen uh, some tremendous growth since then. What, what are sort of the snapshot today, dealer count, uh, you know, number of countries operating in uh, things of, the, uh, of that nature? So we, um, we just finished 2018. And we reported in um, early February. Um, we have approximately um, 5,800 direct uh, certified dealers that have a relationship directly with Control 4. Um, we manage our channel directly in large geographic regions like uh, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, China, and probably another 25 countries. And then we have... Um, about 60 countries that we use two-tier distribution or distributor partners that are really a control for proxy uh, that represent us from a sales, marketing, training, tech support, inventory, and fulfillment. Um, so that's that. We finished 2018 uh, with roughly $272 million in revenue. Um, had a good, good year of profitability, um, good bank account, no debt. And in early 2019, we announced that we had um, acquired the company of NEO and hired its technical and business team to join our adventure to deliver more products to yeah. connect at home. Great. Well, yeah, we're and we're going to talk about that probably a little bit more time permitting, but um, definitely want to want to zoom back to the comment I made just a second ago and sort of start our conversation jumping in to you know the here and now with Control Four and talk about your take on the effects of uh, the increasing uh, DIY and consumer direct options. You know, Seth and I started doing this podcast about five years ago. Um, Right around the time Nest got acquired by Google, and you know everybody and their you know and their mom was coming out with a home automation hub, and uh, it was it was a crazy time, and and we've continued to see a lot of of development and companies come and go during that time. So, you know, share your take overall on the evolution of the DIY and consumer direct market, and you know specifically with an eye towards uh, how it's affecting the professional channel and, and your outlook on on sort of the medium and long term. Um, prospects for the quote unquote traditional, uh, you know, professional channel. So I, I look at it, um, you know, from the outside in and the world is a very big place. And if we think about 
all the products and all the systems and all the dwellings uh, in which we operate, live, learn, play, teach, pray, all of that stuff is getting connected. It is not going to be less connected tomorrow or a year from now or five years than it is today. And every product that consumes electric power, battery, alternating current, direct current, solar current, direct current, it are going to be on networks for various reasons. Everybody is going to play in this connected product space. And some of those products are going to be um, directly purchasable by consumers and directly attachable to their home network. And um, as each product company and each solution provider learns how to augment unconnected products with the benefits of connectedness and computing in the cloud and interactivity and interoperability, um, the, the consumer world, the demand side, is going to become more and more aware of the art of the possible of connected living and connected systems. And so I see that, that outside in of massive change, massive amounts of innovation, lots of chaos, and lots of good examples of things to do, and probably a good number of things not to replicate. And if we, if we look at the professional sector, I think all of that is good for us. Uh, um, and, and companies are going to have to choose or teams are going to have to choose do they want to build a product and bring it directly to consumers for them to buy and connect to their, their networks? Or do you want to provide uh, solutions that are much more integrated with other fabric of the way people live and the way dwellings are built. And for our company, we, we believe that homes and houses are gonna get more and more connected and connectedness is gonna be more and more part of the infrastructure of houses and homes. And we felt that we had a good shot at being a leader in that space and it's a very large market and we could afford the R&D with products geared through that, and we could afford to build a channel that delivered much higher customer satisfaction or durable customer satisfaction. And so that's, our company has focused on that. And we certainly learn from examples of very compelling products um, that are use case specific and highly insightful on customer functionality and, and ease, ease of use and ease of installation. But yet, to date, there aren't a lot of examples of long-term, durable, self-sufficient providers of products with a do-it-yourself uh, profile. And you, know, you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? And um, that's not to say they're bad and they're, they're not going to go away. Um, but our company, Control 4, we've chosen not to follow that path. We're, we're going to keep, keep focused on building connected products and system platform capability to be installed in newly constructed houses, newly constructed custom homes, and to be injected and retrofitted into existing homes and dwellings. And we believe we can build a powerful business and deliver sustained value um, through our channel partners, through our dealers and service providers and installers to end customers. And um, that's our choice. And we, and we, we interoperate with 13,000 third-party products you know, if you can talk to it, it plugs into Control 4. So we look at the connected product phenomena that is, you know, buy it on the web or buy it in a big box store. 
those are accessories to the connected infrastructure of a home. And what we provide is the fabric and the, the connected um, permanents in, in a home. Right. The, the kind of the, the glue that, that binds everything together and makes everything work together is, is where Control 4 is really good at, at sitting and being. Uh, not, not, not to say that, that you don't have your own, own products that, that exist in these, you know, you have your own lighting products when, you know, there are a number of lighting, third-party lighting products out in the market. But guess what? You also integrate with most of those too. So Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, 70% of our business is in the solution categories of lighting, multi-room audio, multi-room video, family room entertainment automation, comfort and convenience, access control, and, and um, communications. And 30% of our business is in our platform products. That's networking and automation. Interesting. So, you know, those are published facts. And we believe that um, a combination of very competent and competitive and functional and beautiful solutions coupled with a democratizing, open, interoperable platform is a very, very powerful long-term strategy. We get to harness everyone else's R&D by letting them plug into our platform, and we get to focus on our R&D on certain disciplines that we want to go deep in, and that's lighting, multi-room audio, multi-room video, family room, entertainment automation, and you know, comfort and convenience. And in certain categories, we just we don't try to compete with a solution, but we interoperate. We don't build door locks, but we work with all of them. We don't build security panels, but we work with all of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think you know, <clears throat> excuse me, to to shift the conversation just slightly to uh, what was a very big story, and I, I think definitely related is the the recent hiring of of Charlie Kindle, and the reason why I say specifically that's sort of related is. Uh, you know, Charlie, I've, I've read his blog posts and had the opportunity to get to know him a little bit, too. And I think a really interesting story from the professional's vantage point, because for those of you who may not be familiar, you know, Charlie was really the head of, of Smart Home. He was the architect of, of Smart Home at, at Alexa and uh, is now, of course, uh, over at Control 4. And, and you can talk a little bit about what he'll be doing there. But I think his perspective as somebody who was really such a key player in the development of what a lot of people think of, as a true, you know, DIY mainstay uh, in the connected home. Yet Charlie has been very public and blogged about his his personal home and how the you know the level of complexity that still exists around the connected home is is not for the faint of heart, right? And so to see him come over to Control Four, I thought was a really really, um, you know, congrats on that hire. I thought it was a great a great hire for you guys, and I'm excited to see. Uh, you know what what comes of that, but but talk a little bit about about bringing Charlie Kindle on board and and sort of what you think that means uh, for the company moving forward. Well, um, we're certainly very excited um, to have Charlie on board. He's been with us, you know, approaching nine months now, and certainly making uh, a difference via you know his leadership and mastery of the subject matter and his. Um, sort of natural way of being data and information driven and team oriented. Um, you know, we were, um, we had an opportunity where um, our prior leader was going to retire and I had to go look for a candidate that understood the connected home and was passionate about it and believed in focusing on the infrastructure of the connected home. And um, through conversations, uh, Charlie and I um, saw a lot in common about the opportunity and the challenges and how to navigate those. And um, the opportunity was timely for him and his posts, his position on, on why and how he's he stated that for himself, so I don't need to repeat that. Um, but we're thrilled. 
and you know we've got uh, a very large uh, software and hardware product development and engineering team. Charlie's leading all of that um, and coordinating you know activities of two large teams in Europe, uh, a team here in Salt Lake, in the in uh, in California, uh, and you know we're thrilled. Uh, we have a lot to do. There's, you know, it's a lot of things in the air, um, but it's a target-rich environment to innovate and and improve. Yeah, ab- absolutely. You mentioned teams over in in Europe, and that brings me back to something you mentioned a few minutes ago: is the uh, the recent acquisition of of Neo. And I think, if I understand correctly, and you, you obviously correct me if I'm wrong, is Charlie will be uh, will be leading uh, that team, and uh, Neo will be. Uh, you know, becoming part of the team and, and talk a little bit about the NEO acquisition and, and sort of the reasons behind it. And, and again, what you're, you know, what you're excited about, like, what does that mean for Control 4 moving forward? Um, well, you know, we're excited about having uh, the, the team uh, from NEO. Um, they're based in Bern, Switzerland, um, and um, they're focused on interaction devices, not just handheld remotes, but uh, focused on those physical products um, with which uh, customers directly interact, that they're visible. A lot of our products are, you know, hidden in, in racks and are sort of inf- hidden infrastructure. And then several of them are, are very visible and, and are iconic to the consumer experience. And when we met Raphael and his team, we found uh, a, a really insightful and already cohesive team uh, that understood the connected home and the needs of the consumer. They understood industrial design, uh, mechanical design, design for manufacturing, electrical design. They understood embedded firmware and how to write compelling software that used um, was very efficient from a computation and, and, and electric power consumption, you know, because of battery. And when we looked at how long it would take to, to, to really build a, a scalable team around that, we felt that um, the NEO team had demonstrated that they had a, a unique perspective and had already formed a cohesive team on that, which would take us you know, better part of a year or two to find and form that kind of team. Uh, and we found that the, the Neo remote itself was a powerful um, physical world example of what that team could produce. Um, and we said, you know, let's make that the basis of a portion of our handheld remote strategy, which we had already underway. Um, and the Neo team became an accelerant of that, and um, and now they're working on it. You know, we're fully fully uh, focused on bringing uh, a new set of products into the Control Four world um, to be sold through our channel in all the regions where we support um, our dealers. Uh, we're not going to sell that product directly. Uh, to consumers, we've already discontinued the the Neo Kickstarter-like uh, business that's been shut down, and um, you know pretty soon we'll start testing what these guys have uh, integrated. And once it goes through a pretty rigorous set of internal tests and field tests, um, We'll make announcements on what that product is and how it's priced and what it's good for. Oh, interesting. I very good. I as a well as a as a Neo remote owner and as a <laughs> Control Four <laughs> systems owner and programmer and developer, uh, I can't wait to see that because I uh, I mean I, don't get me wrong I I love the the two fifties and two sixties that I have laying around. I think those are those are great remotes uh, and I I think they have been for a long time. Um, but you know, there's, there's a certain, I don't know, for the lack of better term, sex appeal that the Neo has, uh, over. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think that, you know, one thing that, you know, control four is on, on a journey, um, to continue to become a better and better provider 
uh, of, of solutions and platforms. And when we started, you know, in 2000, started shipping product in 2008, you know, the iPhone wasn't even ubiquitous and Wi-Fi wasn't even ubiquitous. I mean, it, and today the world is very different. And so when we started the, our first set of, of challenges was to introduce really compelling and novel automation capability. And, and we did that. And very quickly we realized that capability and functionality that's cool isn't enough. It has to be durable, solid, extensible. And so the next chapter after delivering, you know, cool stuff was make it infrastructure. And so we continued on that journey. And if, if you followed Control 4 from 2010, 2011 through 2017 and 18, you saw dramatic changes in how we built software, how we built hardware, how we, re how we, how we tested and released it how our failure rates have come way down, how our ability to manage homes remotely and update them has dramatically changed. I mean, we released OS 2.10.6 four weeks ago. We have almost 30,000 homes running software that we released four, less than four weeks ago. I mean, think about, think, think about that. You know, five years ago, 10 years ago, that would have taken forever and it would have taken truck. No, absolutely. I've, I've been, I've been a, uh, I started my, I started with a control four dealer in the one, two, five era. So we were, we yeah. were ground level. <laughs> and, uh, so, but the, but the next layer that's on top of, you know, first you come up with cool functionality, then you got to make it durable and expansible and industrial strength. And then for us, the next chapter is really upping the game with regard to industrial design and aesthetic and that we, we we we've provided a few deposits with our new tabletop touchscreen and it's it's industrial design um our in-wall touchscreens we're we're making progress now we made a, a a visible commitment on the handheld remote and i think you'll see stuff in the lighting category and other interaction devices where we're going to up our game on the industrial design side and as well as keeping the advance on functionality and durability and extensibility. Interesting. I, I, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Um, I want to pivot a little bit uh, as, as we're kind of running, we'll, we'll, we'll slowly running short on our time, but um, I, I privacy is, is kind of a big thing these days, or it's getting to be more of a big thing these days. It certainly Certainly on the the periphery here in the states and o over in Europe in the EMEA markets, it's probably a little bit more prevalent for you uh, as as you work, you know, internationally. What um, there's an interesting Bloomberg Bloomberg story uh, that we'll put in our show notes that that is uh is about uh, things that Amazon and Google are doing uh, in, in regards to um, in be have, letting developers interact with their systems. And, uh, and, and, and how they, they want those developers to kind of report on that uh, information, I guess, back to Amazon or Google. I, I'm wondering what Control 4's stance is on privacy uh, and, and what, what your thoughts are on kind of this, this era that we've moved into with uh, having data <laughs> coming out of the home and going up into the cloud. Um, well, again, you know, this is one where I would say let's start on the outside and, and work in. Um, we are big proponents of overt consumer privacy. What happens in a customer's home with regard to the interaction of their connected devices orchestrated by Control 4 stays within the scope of their home uh, unless they overtly and consciously approve its flow otherwise. We um, have adopted GDPR, the European standard for, for information privacy for our company worldwide. 
That's what we do. That's our standard. And we and and it's simple for our employees. I mean, it's it's a complex topic, but we don't do things differently because California lets you do different things than what you can do in Germany or in China or in Australia. We say GDPR is the standard for us, and if there's a place in the world that has a higher standard than that, we're going to aim towards uh, being as um, privacy respectful for the consumer as possible. And um, since we orchestrate so many devices within the home from all sorts of different vendors, not only our own, we have a special responsibility and a special entrustment um, from our end customers, our homeowners and families. The average control for home orchestrates 43 connected devices. The top 10% of our connected homes, in those top 10%, the average is 180. If you go to the top 100 installations, you're talking about homes with over 1,200 connected devices. So our responsibility of how we orchestrate what happens what, what triggers an action, whether that's an overt consumer action or whether that's state driven by temperature or a motion sensor or time of day or somebody driving into the driveway, that information has to stay within the purview of the homeowner and within our trust sphere. And we're, we're very, very uh, deliberate about that. And when we interact with other services uh, like voice services, we've designed those interfaces so that uh, a consumer can empower their home via voice commands for a large number of those 43 or 180 devices in their home. So there is a namespace for interaction across the entire home. And we think that if you, if a homeowner says, voice service, let's watch CNN, we'll do that. And we would assume that the voice service knows that CNN was triggered. But if the homeowner uses his handheld remote or his iPhone or Android app to change the channel to Fox News, that information stays within the home. And I don't see any reason why the voice service should be told that the TV is now on Fox News. Agreed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and likewise, if every, if every light is addressable by name within a control system and thus addressable through voice, if the consumer says, the homeowner says, turn on the bathroom light, you assume the voice service knows that the bathroom light is on. But if the consumer turns the bathroom light on at 2 a.m. via a physical switch or a motion sensor, why should the voice service be told that? Right, right. I agree. I agree. And, and so, so we, we, we believe in, in that kind of construct. We think that a consumer at some time, as the world becomes more connected, there may be reasons in the future that a consumer says, you know, I, I don't mind if the voice service knows what's going on with my lights. I don't mind if the voice service knows what's going on on my TV. But I'm sure it's not going to tell them about my door locks and my security system. And so we have to come up with mechanisms by which consumers can knowingly, consciously, and, and, and in a knowledgeable way grant permissions for certain kinds of data flow. Because if we do that wrong, we will have broken the trust that we've already established over 15 years and 400,000 customers. And we're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and, and I think you know, Will, we had this uh, link up in our show notes a couple of weeks ago. This may sound familiar to some of our listeners, but we'll we'll include it again. It was a piece in Bloomberg that uh, that I know you were you were quoted in uh, amongst other manufacturers. And I thought it was a really interesting uh, perspective and something that that by and large I think flies under most people's radar. But that distinction between voice servers, you know, having access to data where they're being called upon to do things um, versus just wanting this constant sort of stream of of information about the home and uh, really, really interesting distinction. And and I think, you know, you make some great points on there. And uh, certainly from my humble perspective, uh, sounds like you guys are thinking about that uh, in all the right ways. So definitely appreciate you sharing your perspectives on that. Uh, we are, as Seth alluded to, running up against our time a little bit. But before we wrap up, I, I did want to get your take on just kind of the macro um market trends and, and things that are going on out there. Uh, you know, as a CEO of, of a public company, you're obviously paying very close attention uh, to these things. And, and, and from, from my side of the, of the coin, I, you know, working at One Vision, I'm, I'm talking to integrators all the time, every day. And, and certainly uh, these uh, sort of potential headwinds and, and housing trends and geopolitical uh, concerns and volatility in the stock market are all very, very real concerns when it comes to uh, operating in the professional uh, home technology space. So, what are, what are you seeing to the extent that uh, you know that obviously you can share what what you guys are are sort of thinking about when it comes to to this topic at Control Four? I'd I'd love what you could you know if you could share that with our audience. Um, well, for us and and on our uh, early February earnings conference call, I, I shared um, remarks that I can reiterate here today. Um, we do see a combination of geopolitical uncertainty in several large areas of planet Earth. You know, one big one is um, in the UK and Brexit and its uh, radiant impact uh, across the EU. Um, another area is the trade, trade war, trade trade dispute between the U.S. and China and the introduction of escalating tariffs um, and how that impacts many, many businesses. And then you have stock market volatility that has an impact on, um, I would say, upper middle class or, or um, the higher income producers and higher investment um, portions of the economy that cause them to take pause. And I think those all those layers um, can cause decision makers to slow down or be more reserved with regard to capital purchases. You know, should we do that remodel? Yes or no? Do we have to do it now, or should we wait six months? Um, I think the tariff situation um, has impacted lots and lots of business owners and senior managers in their own companies who probably didn't get a 2018 bonus because their business was impacted by by the by 10 percent or 15 percent tariffs and the threat of 25 percent tariffs. And those and those people hold back on decisions. You know, if they had planned to go buy their spouse a new BMW, they're probably going to say, you know, let's wait and see until it settles out, and let's let's take a checkpoint till June. So we certainly see that as a, a macro overlay for the business in Q4 2018. I think it's continuing in Q in Q1. Probably will go into Q2. Um, it's still a healthy economy, but if you measure it relative to the backdrop of the first half of 2018 and all of 2017, it is different. And as a, a manager and a leader of a, of a company with, you know. 750 employees and an ecosystem of 50,000 employee partners of our dealers. We have to be prudent and um, somewhat uh, transparent and transmitting 
of what we see. And then how do we help our channel and our customers and our employees navigate that choppiness? And um, I think the Control 4 team is doing a good job at that. And, and you know, it, it, it may end up being a little bit more choppy than we expect. Um, but, you know, we're conscious about it. Right. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot going on right now. I don't think... Uh, I mean, I know that Control 4 is not the only one that are looking down the road going, oh, it looks like we may, we might be a little cooler on our, uh, on what, on what it, we're expecting to come in the door. And yeah, it's, it's, it's prudence and, and it's a good thing to have uh, these days. On that note, can you tell us what uh, is, is exciting Control 4 these days? What, what are you, what are you excited for uh, that you guys maybe, I know you can't talk about what you're working on right now, but um, may, maybe, maybe what, what you're looking at down the road that, that is exciting. Um, you know, say the economy is, is great and everything. What, what's, what's exciting, uh, for control Four uh, down the road from now? Um, well, you know, again, I, I think the connected home and connected consumers and connected improved living is, is, is just a big opportunity that isn't going to go away. And we are in a step-by-step fashion continuing to invest and put pieces in place to deliver better and better on that promise. In the last year, we've rolled out our certified showroom program so that consumers can have a predictable place to get a very compelling, very competent overview of the art of the possible of a control for connected home. You know, we have 207 certified showrooms and another hundred plus applications. So that's working really well. Our business to date has been focused on homes, you know, where the homeowner is known. 50% is custom homes, new construction, and 50% custom retrofit. And we've been focused on production builders to augment our homes business where production builders build houses to sell them to become homes. And we see that houses are going to be built smart, if not smart ready. And we want to be a leading provider of the connected infrastructure and solutions for those production houses that get built smart and then sold to become homes. And they're already a smart home. And so that's exciting. Um, What we're doing to up our game on industrial design of our products is exciting. Um, I mentioned that we have a a, a fairly large engineering and product development organization. 2018 was was a a modest year for product releases for us because we have an exciting pipeline of products coming. And um, so that's that's pretty thrilling. Um, We just went direct in New Zealand. that used to be under the purview of a distributor. We bought that business from the distributor and now we're direct in New Zealand. We'll see rapid expansion there. Um, We went direct in Switzerland because we now have a team in Bern. There's no reason to have a direct presence for engineering and an indirect presence for sales. So now we have have that and likewise in Ireland. So those are, it's it's step-by-step. And, you know, when, when you know the opportunity is real and durable, how, how you put the pieces together in, in, in a methodical way really matters. And I think we've demonstrated that over the past seven years, and um, our opportunity is not exhausted, and we're going to keep doing it. All right. Very good. Well, Martin, we definitely appreciate you taking some time to come on the show and share uh, all of these updates about Control 4. I know I've really enjoyed it, and I am quite sure that our listeners will uh, as well. Speaking of our listeners, if they wanted to learn more, you know, we've, we've got a mix here of uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of professionals listen to the show, but we've also got, uh, you know, some end users and, and enthusiasts. So, uh, you know, maybe if you're a dealer interested in learning more about how to, how to become a, or an integrator, I should say, uh, want, wanting to know more about how to become a Control 4 dealer, uh, how do you go and learn more? And then conversely, uh, if, you're a, if you're a consumer or end user, uh, what would be the best way to go about doing that? Well, I think that the starting place is at, you know, www.control4.com. 
Um, there's a lot of information there about our product line. There's a lot of information there about um, how to, if you're an existing customer, how to get um, some help from one of our dealers or from our customer advocacy group. Um, if you're uh, an integrator or an IT professional and you're interested in learning more about how to get into uh, the smart home industry, um, there's pages of information there on how to get started and who to contact and what forms to fill out. Uh, we manage our channel directly. We have, you know, uh, over a hundred people in our sales organization. So we, we can be pretty attentive to um, inbound inquiries that start out on our website. All right. Well, thanks again, Martin. We really do appreciate it. And definitely, uh, you know, we'll look forward to checking back in with you, uh, you know, in the future here to see uh, how things are, are panning out. But thank you so much again for, uh, for taking the time to come on and share these updates with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And that wraps up the interview with Martin. Uh, I want to say thank him again for coming on the show. We really do appreciate his time. And uh, man, Jason, uh, very, very interesting to talk to the CEO of, of arguably, I, I don't know, I, I would argue with most people these days, because that's what I like to do. <laughs> no, but, you're good uh, at you it. Know, arguably one of the, the premier, uh, premier and leading uh, vendors of home automation control product uh, in, in the industry. I, I think when you think of the CDA market, it's hard not to think like Control 4 yeah. anymore, right? Yeah. Back when you and I started, <laughs> Control 4 was not a, a brand that many people were very loyal to. But now it seems that the the tide has turned and uh, very interesting to have him on the show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we talked about uh, Snap AV earlier in the episode and certainly Snap AV and, and Control 4 arguably, you know, I don't know the numbers, but probably the two biggest companies in in the residential, uh, you know, custom install side of, uh, of the smart home. And, uh, so yeah, really great. Definitely. Like you said, appreciated Martin taking the time to join us and really uh, enjoyed the conversation. Hope our listeners did as well. So what do you say, Seth? We, uh, you want to jump into the mailbag? I think we got a good one this week. Yeah, we, uh, we do. We got a, a an interesting letter, uh, based on our conversation, uh, about TV security, um, from, from listener Scott R., and uh, he wrote in, uh, after hearing your bit about regarding TV, TVs, ads, and privacy violations, I wanted to pass along what I do. You mentioned the possibility of doing ad blocking at the router level. This is, in fact, what I do. Uh, I use the free router software PFSense, uh, and he says, admittedly, this is very geared towards advanced user. It's not for the timid. <laughs> and I will, I will agree with that. PFSense, is, I've, I've had my kind of like eye on that for a while. Uh, PF sense is like just a very geeky, completely complete setup. Like if you were doing security in your business, that's probably the router you'd want to have. Uh, if not, you know, maybe a more commercial version of it, but, uh, I, I, I've heard great things about that. He goes on to write, I have PF sense blocking, not just ads, but numerous, uh, known malicious, malicious IPs and domains. And sometimes he's very surprised about how effective it is. Uh, he says, I'll watch videos, uh, through Roku apps and there'll be blank pauses where it tries and fails to play an ad before the video then continues. Um, sometimes it's a little too aggressive. Uh, the Amazon shopping app on Android uh, is very unhappy with it, and I've not dived in to determine what I might need to get in there and, and, uh, and whitelist off for that to work. Um, so he's just passing along that he, he uses... Um, th there's a couple different ways of setting this up, this PFSense. There, there's one little small... I want to say $130 box that you can get that, that makes it super easy. Uh, and it's got a, you know, a, a, it's, it's not like you're at a um, command line typing stuff in, Jason. It actually does have a GUI where you can go and configure things like a router. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it has a ton of features uh, on PFSense. And uh, I've heard good things about it, and I just haven't had a chance to dive into it as, as Scott has. But it sounds like I might want to uh, in the future here. Yeah, it's definitely an, definitely an interesting uh, interesting offering. I think it is, uh, you know, like you said, it sounds like it's n not for the faint of heart and probably something that I will therefore skip. <laughs> not necessarily because I don't think I could figure it out. I just I just I just can't be bothered. I think I'd I'd rather just have some ads. I you know, the ad blocking um stuff isn't all that like compelling to me. I'm not that bothered by it, but if it could help with uh, you know, privacy and the growing concerns around that, then um, I think these sort of solutions are certainly uh, uh, appealing to me. And I think that that's where you get into like the more broad 
uh, appeal. But yeah, ad blocking, I, I get it. Um, nothing, nothing against it, obviously, but it, you know, the ads don't, don't tend to bother me so much. And so if it's, uh, a, a weekend of sort of wrangling this thing into position. Uh, I, I'll just stick with the ads for now. Well, yeah, I, I, I think that's what you'll probably be uh, like. Most people will do that, right? Right. Like not everybody is going to go out and uh, and set something up like like this up. I, I don't know. I think in the future it might be uh, something that's built into more routers. Like it, it seems like the this privacy thing has some legs to it, right? Oh yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, they're, they're, more more so than I thought there would be. Um, two years ago, <laughs> you know, like I think we started talking about security and IOT stuff, uh, maybe two or three years ago. And it's just kind of been a slow burn up into the point where, uh, we've had some very interesting things, uh, both, you know, political and not political that, ha- that have come from privacy, uh, concerns, right? Like you, in ads that people are getting creeped out by, they think their Amazon, uh, echo is listening to them 24 seven because, uh, they know what they want to buy, and it turns out no, the ads are just that good. Like the algorithms are just that good; they don't even need to listen to you. They just know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think people are getting creeped out by that, and uh, you know, I hopefully it seems like, at least here in the U.S., it seems like there's there's political wind that's starting to kind of line up and get behind both both on both. Like we have two different <laughs> diametrically opposed uh <laughs> houses of uh houses of uh, uh uh what do they call it uh parties here yeah you uh, can but say that they, again. They, they, it, <laughs> it seems like there might be some wind behind both of them at this point like it's i can most americans if you ask them about this they would probably say yeah you know i kind of find that creepy and i don't want that to happen right and i think that congress and and and, and those in power are probably you know if they're smart, they'll go ahead and figure out how to make this happen and make it done, get it done right. Yeah, and we may end up with something like GDPR here in, in the states, which w- would be nice. Yeah, I, I think there, there's got to be a middle ground, right? And uh, I, I agree. I think we've we've uh, we've gone a little bit too far to one end of of the uh, the pendulum swing, and it is due to due to swing back and um, hopefully not go too far back in the other direction, as can sometimes happen with these sort of you know, political and uh, social types of, of concerns. But um, yeah, it's interesting. And I do think, you know, novel approaches to, um, uh, to to privacy and I guess ad blocking maybe, but, you know, other things like just privacy and security and seeing over the next maybe two to five years, like what companies are able to do in that space. It'll, it'll be really interesting. I think there's definitely some, some opportunities in the market uh, for companies to, uh, you know, to come out and, and fix a real problem. So it'd be interesting. Would be nice. We've got a real gem of a pick of the week this week, Seth, and want to give a big thank you to uh, Robert from The Hub. We we definitely appreciate this one. I got a get got a good laugh out of out of it. So <clears throat> I'll do my do my best to walk walk through this one. So you've got a you've got uh, clearly a husband and wife uh, couple, and the the wife is standing with a very sort of uh, terse terse or uh, you know a, a kind of angry look on her face with her arms crossed she's leaning against the door you got the husband standing over the bed uh sort of looking kind of over his shoulder and folding laundry uh on the bed and the caption says okay last night you washed dishes today you're folding laundry you bought more speakers didn't you <laughs> it's a good one. Oh man it's a good one. that feeling that feeling yeah yeah, yeah. Uh. You know, <laughs> hats off to the guy. He's doing his best. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, it, it's it's you know, our spouses always know, right? They're, they they've only they they figured this out by now. Oh, right, indeed. Jason, and yeah, they, they already know. <laughs> the the spouse acceptance I, factor is is real. Is very real. I might uh, not apply to this one, but uh, you know, more I don't know, AirPods or computer parts or something. <laughs> Right, right. Doesn't necessarily have to be speakers. Yeah, <laughs> no. For me, gear. it's like usually fly fishing stuff, but it's all the same. <laughs> it's the same reaction. Yep, yep. Absolutely, absolutely. If you have any uh, feedback, questions, comments, picks of the week, or great ideas for the show, give us a shout. Our email address is feedback at hometech.fm, or visit us at hometech.fm/feedback and fill out the online form. As we always do, we want to give a big, big thank you to everyone who supports the show, uh, but especially to those those of you who are able to financially contribute to our efforts here at Home Tech through our Patreon page. If you are not familiar with Patreon, head on over to hometech.fm/support, where you can learn how 
to support our efforts here for as little as $1 a month. Uh, any pledge over $5 will give you a big shout out on air, but every single pledge will get you an invite to our private Slack chat, The Hub, where you and other supporters of the show can gather every day for all of the uh, inside baseball conversations about uh, about home tech. So it's a great community there and always a lot of fun. Yep. And if you uh, want to help out but can't support the show financially, we'd appreciate a five-star review on iTunes or a positive rating in the podcast app of your choice. Uh, you know, we, we we're aiming for that five stars, Jason. That's This is a five-star show. That's we want to we keep That's it that way. I have no idea what a rating is right now, <laughs> but it, it helps other people find the show, and, and that's, you know, that's what counts. It's right, yeah. No, it's it, it's it's still up there. I think I think we got a couple, like, four, maybe one, three, that the guy was, like, not happy that we were, like, talking about pro stuff. And I was like, oh, no. we're, well, you just got to keep pros. listening. That's like, all. I mean, we, we go in and out. I mean, it just depends on... <laughs> Who's going out of business in the, in right. the DIY market? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> so anyways, you know, you can't please everyone, right? No, no, can't. All right, cool. Well, uh, that will do it for our show this week. Had a lot of fun. Hope everyone enjoyed. And Seth, we'll definitely look forward to reconnecting with you again next week. Sounds good, Jason. Have a great weekend. All right. You too. Take care.